The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. I'm here with Suzanne Lantier. Now, I've only known her really with one title, and that was Director of the Development for Grand Theatre, and we've got to know her pretty well over the years. But Suzanne, you're not that anymore. What is it, what is it you're transitioning to? I'm transitioning to uh, to the same title, but just at a at, at another theater, uh, Theater Aquarius uh, in Hamilton, Ontario. So, after about seven years, I I left, decided to leave the Grand uh, uh, for some new challenges, uh, just down the road, down the 403 at that Theater Aquarius. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to hear how you make out there. But for right now, can we go back a few years and talk about when we kind of first met and had a talk? I think it was you and Deb Harvey, the executive director, asked Jane and I for a meeting. Do you remember that? And we came down to the Grand and we were overlooking Richard Monroe. And do you remember that talk? I do. I do. I have very fond memories of that talk. And it was it was honestly it was uh, it was close to my the beginning of my tenure at the Grand, too. So it was a very exciting time and I remember I remember very distinctly um, when Deb and I uh, talked about the concept and the idea that you and Jane um, were uh, were speechless uh, about and I could sort of see the wheels uh, moving about what the impact could potentially be so I do have fond memories of that yes yeah, I mean, I, I, it's true that the gears in my head were swimming. We weren't sure what it was about. But when you two talked to us about it, I began connecting all these dots in my head. For instance, uh, right around that time, CBC Sounds of the Season had started up. So they do these stories about the food bank for the whole month of December. Of course, what you and Deb were talking to Jane and I about were these programs for the month of December. And I just started seeing all these other things that could connect with it. And I think that's one of the beauties of the grand we work with a lot of different groups right but when it comes to the grand you just realize it's following is fairly diverse it comes from different parts of the city even outside of the city so if the grand is going to partner with you to do something the chances are really good it will transcend a lot of normal boundaries and draw other people in but do you remember uh, what it was that you and, and deb had said that you had wanted to do for that month of december yeah, I do. It was actually an idea that um, that was really born out of um, of our our artistic director Dennis Gardem, who had recently arrived from Theater Aquarius. And at Theater Aquarius, it seems to be sort of a prevailing theme of, of theaters across across Canada. But at Theater Aquarius, uh, Dennis said that they had been doing um, a tradition called Tunis for Turkeys every year, where um, at the end of every performance, um, one of the cast members, typically the lead, they they did a Christmas Carol over um, a number of seasons at Theatre Aquarius and and the, uh, the 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 actor that played Scrooge would get up and make an appeal about uh, the need uh, in the city of Calgary and ask for monetary donations so we had we uh, Dennis came in with the idea and um, you know Deb and I just said well let's talk to Jane and Glenn I mean because Deb uh, knew knew both of you from before and um, let's see what we can do um, we had we went into it with really no expectations whatsoever not really knowing what to expect in terms of the the um, the outpouring of support that we've received from our patrons but so it was it was really um, it was really a presentation of sort of this concept of hey what do you think if if, if we were to do this and oh my gosh what a great thing it was I remember we came to opening night not knowing quite what to expect but here you have Ebenezer Scrooge right just as grumpy as all get out uh, normal and um, of course the the story of Christmas carols the transformation that Ebenezer goes through and I mean it, it was just so beautifully done and the music and everything was just so great and Jane I just lapped it right up but then it ends 
and then the cast kind of recedes and then Ebenezer stands at the front of the stage, right? And begins yeah. to talk to people about hunger in London. And it just seemed to be a continuation of the transformation he had just been going through for the last hour and a half. And here he was, you know, speaking about people that were marginalized or people that, you know, weren't being included in regular society stuff. It was just so powerful. And I can't remember it. And then the cast came out and they started collecting uh, for the food bank. And I can't remember how much it was. It was a really generous donation that night but the fit was perfect what was what was your impression that night when you saw that like you watched the play and i'm sure you enjoyed it as much as we did but then i watched it every night of the run to be okay. honest with you it, it was such a for me it was such a magical um it was a magical ending to the show. I remember getting goosebumps every single night when the snow would come down, when Jared, our, our head, head of flies, would would be uh, putting snow down into the audience. And um, you know, it was it was it was pretty incredible. Ben Campbell was our original Scrooge in that in that first year of production, and um, and he was remarkable in, in how he spoke about uh, the need in London. And you know, um, I remember we tried to um, we tried to marry the message about the need with um, the, our audience sizes and, and how um, the need every month at the Food Bank in London was 10 times the amount of people that were sitting in the audience. So I think that was really helpful in, because I remember the audible gasps when 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 he would say that stat and I, I get goosebumps now thinking about it too about how high the need is and then I also remember as part of that show you know the cast who were so generous with their time after a long show and a very demanding show and the last scene where they're on rollerblades making like they're skating around they would whip off the stage and take off the rollerblades and I would be out in the lobbies uh, most for most performances at the end and they would run up the stairs as fast as they could to get positioned within the lobby spaces to to meet uh, to meet the audience members and accept the donations it was really just uh it was an incredible um um just so incredible for for all of us that were there and then i i will say this too it was a full company a full company commitment because um you know our staff on the following more on the mornings after um we would gather in our in our lounge um and we would count and it was an incredible so we have really everybody throughout the building everybody who participated in it in 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 some way shape or form in in humbug to hunger year number one in some way shape or form so it, it was really an incredible way of galvanizing the entire staff around uh, around this uh around humbug to hunger and then it morphed a bit, right? In, in, in the later years, you ended up with a female character playing Ebenezer Scrooge, which was so unique. And I remember the places being packed, uh, being packed, and people loving it so much. But it had a different flavor to it. You know, the incredible uh, Jan Alexander Smith, yeah, who, she was awesome who really she spoke at the just, end. Yeah. yeah, and she is so, um, you know, she's so beloved by London audiences, um, and she has played so many roles uh, on our street stage, and uh, just so beloved. And and her message, you know, you didn't think you you can't imagine that it would get better than what Ben had to say, but it was just her message. She was just, you know, she she felt it. You could see that she felt yeah. it deep down. No. And then, you know, what was wonderful is that the cast decided to come down to the food bank and sort food. And what was amazing about that was that um, they, many of them stayed in dress that they would normally be in in the play. And so I, I remember coming down and, and doing some video with my camera. And, and the, you know, here were all our food bank volunteers. They had really no idea this was going to be happening. And then all of a sudden, these people with top hats and long coats and scarves and all that kind of stuff. We're all walking around. They're helping to sort food. And, and I remember the volunteers were just kind of in a state of shock. And it wasn't just the fact that the Grand was coming down, but they chose to stay in costume when they did that. And, and I, re, I remember just the feeling about that, that, you know, poverty has lingered with us for that lengthy period of time, you know, ever since the time of Charles Dickens, obviously. But here was the cast coming down, and suddenly it wasn't the Grand 
brand anymore, putting on something to help the food bank and hoping people would come in to see it. They took a show on the road, so to speak, into the food bank warehouse. And I think our volunteers got a chance to see a different side to the grand that they hadn't before. They got to work side by side with Jane Alexander or other cast members. Um, you were there for that too, I remember, but th did you feel that that was as transformative as it is that I felt that it was? It really was. And, and then from my perspective, you know, um, this is something that we um, had organized with, with you and Jane. Mm -hmm. And we had to obviously get a date that was going to work well, uh, both for our cast and for the volunteers down at the food bank. And, you know, for a lot of the cast that uh, participated, this is what a, this was their day off. This was their their chance to sort of take a break from the rehearsals and from the from the grind. And it is quite a grind mm -hmm. to get a, a show of that size up on the stage. So what what I what I took away from that was like how generous they were with their time and how, you know, we sort of we got on. I remember getting in, onto a bus. We we rented a bus to sort of bring ourselves down there, and and we were all in, you know, super festive moods and getting off. And and it was quite, um, you know, the 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 positivity stayed throughout. And and but I think it was really. Um, for, for me personally, and I know for the cast, who were just so grateful at the end to have to have been able to do that, that it was really, it was a way for all of them to really understand uh, what the need was and how hard, you know, the volunteers at the food bank work uh, to do this and, and how it's not, um, it's, it's, it's serious business. Feeding our feeding our citizens is really serious business, and you know, checking the labels and making sure that everything is safe, and making sure that everything is sorted, and making sure that all of that it 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 was less of like oh we're going to sort this. So it was really serious business, and they and they took it quite seriously. I mean, we had a few little fun competitions. I remember Deb uh, being she's super competitive, um, and so competitions about sorting. But it was really uh, it was really a great opportunity for for everyone to sort of come full circle and really have a good understanding about what it is, why we were making the asks and what the needs were and 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 the support team behind them, including you and Jane and the volunteers and that type of thing. And then it morphed again into the next year and then it became Mary Poppins. And I remember how magical that was as well. But how was that as a shift? Was it hard letting go of a Christmas Carol and going towards that or no? Just... Well, the, hard, the hardest thing of letting go was uh, letting go of our, our, our cute little tagline of humbug to hunger. But um, the, um, you know, we, we came our, I think that year we came up with super califragilistic XBL donate. Um, and I, you know, poor Deb Hay, who was the Mary Poppins in the show, had to get that one out every single night after a two and a half hour performance. So, you know, it, it really wasn't, it really wasn't hard. I mean, again, we have, we have such incredible casts um, around and, and we do draw a lot of our casts, particularly for our holiday show from London, like Mark Year, who played Bert in that show, you know, is from London, his family's from London. We have a lot of, you know, our junior cast from London. So it was, um, you know, having Londoners actually speak about the need in London um, is really, um, really just adds an extra bit of weight. And, you know, all throughout the time, I, I remember, um, uh, again, in, in probably in the Mary Poppins years, I remember distinctly so many families coming up to us, people coming up to us, making donations in the lobby spaces and, and, and having a few families actually saying, you know what, I've had to use the food bank myself so i just want to give back it's, like, it's just remarkable you know that um the 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 families that have to use it the individuals that have to use the food bank that find themselves in that situation you know it's as diverse as as the audiences that are coming into the grand clearly and now you've gone and morphed it again so what is it that's happening this year i mean, actually it starts shortly but what's going on this year this year, um, our holiday production of the Grand Theatre is Elf, and um, I'm going to get the name wrong because I haven't been through there at the Grand throughout the time, but it's it has something to do with sparkle, jingle, tingle, jolly. So the, so the team has come up with, as I understand it, a, a fun and fantastic name. Um, and um, I said, uh, um, who is playing the lead role of Buddy the Elf, um, and that's, that's another important thing to, to remember, too, is that, you know, at the beginning of 
have rehearsal process when the cast and the and the, the staff team are standing around in a circle for the first rehearsal. Dennis, um, Dennis, you know, ha has already made the ask of the lead to to make that uh, to make the ask. So I said signed on, of course, immediately, and um, and so sparkle jingle tingle. It's a song in Elf that's uh, super super fun. So uh, after two years of uh, first an online offering, and then last year we had a you know reduced audience sizes. It will be super fun to be back in full houses again and really maximizing um, maximizing the donations for the food bank. Yeah, that's right. In that first year, I remember when we sat down and had that first talk with you and Deb, we really appreciated that Dennis had introduced that as maybe an idea that could be pursued. But I remember somehow in that conversation, business cares kind of fit into that discussion. And, and I remember how interesting it was to see that, you know, those back then, I think it was like 500 businesses that were part of business cares. You know, uh, I knew it was, uh, we really appreciated that the grant decided we'll help the food bank, but we'll come under the business cares envelope to, to do that. But for the businesses that were there, that, that was really new and different. And then I remember when we had the kickoff for the business cares drive, you had some of the folks from the cast come up and do stuff. And for those businesses, that was totally new. They hadn't seen anything like that before. But how did you think that the fit went with business cares over the years? It started right then and it's continued since. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I I remember, you know, the first thing that Jane said was, we need to put you in touch with Wayne Dunn. You need to be part of Business Cares. And um, so we did that, went to the first meeting and met like this incredible human being, Wayne Dunn, who has done so much for the city over or over the years and what you know it, it was it was great like we were we were really the only not-for-profit other not-for-profits sitting around the table of these extraordinary business leaders across london and you know to 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 be able to share what we were doing and to also hear the passion of what everyone else around the room was doing it's really been uh, a win-win for us we've we've you know i've made some great personal friends out of that uh, business cares committee yes. and uh, mm -hmm. and the grant has made some amazing um corporate connections uh through through business cares we hosted our, just before the pandemic um mandy fields the another extraordinary human being um asked us to host a, uh, a tampon Tuesday um, around the opening of room of, and we had Emma Donahue come out and speak and I remember this we talked about this this was you know three days before everything shut down in the world we had a packed crowd in in what was then our McManus is now our Auburn theater um, and we had like just you know scads and scads of, of uh, female sanitary products and it was and it was an amazing and extraordinary night we had no idea what was about to face us in the coming days but really the the relationships that we've formed have just been have just been extraordinary we you know i'll name in particular you know um mike uh, mike carter and the ldca who mike is a he's a theater guy uh through and through and he's done everything in his power to help you know marry um what the ldca does with what the grand theater does and um, it's my understanding that this year they've actually the ldca is holding their big sort of year-end gala at the Grand in conjunction with Delph and we're we were working on ways of how we maximize, you know, the impact the LDCA is going to have with the with the funness of of the Elf show. So it's just such a win-win. It really is an extraordinary group of, of people. And just to be clear, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars here. That, that's what's happened over the course of this run. And I know it continues and we appreciate it. But this this wasn't some just get together holiday kind of celebration. Let's pass the hat and see how it goes. This is a well-organized effort, fully embodied in the cast itself and in the staff of the Grand. But it just became such a major success. But when you look at it cumulatively, cumulatively over the years, this was all happening at the same time our numbers were going up. So when we first talked about uh, that first year, you know, back then we were helping about 2,100 families a month. Now it's 4,000. Yeah. We're in record territory. And when you consider the agencies that we're helping, it's 21,000 people we are helping every month. Now, 
Fortunately for us, the grant has stayed with us through all of that, right? Because as that has increased, business cares has become even more important. The grant has become more important. But I, I hope that you and the folks from the grant realize just we, we weren't just a group always at the same level. We were a group that every year was getting more and more challenged. And for mm -hmm. every year to be able to come by and, and still see these partners still coming and putting out the way that they were, that's meant so much to us. Suzanne, it has, because uh, what we're up against now is something we've never been through in our 36 year history. So still having the grand on side really means something to us. I hope I hope everybody there knows that. Well, I think so. And I, and I the other thing too, Glenn, is that, um, you know, there's no question that there's been a number of businesses and industries that have been really hard hit through the pandemic. But I will say as someone that um, sees um, the impact on the theater industry um, up close and personal that, you know, the, the actors, uh, the production teams, the talented folks who work both on and off the stage, it was a pretty, that was a group that was hit really hard with everything shutting down. And, uh, and this is what folks uh, in our industry go to school for. They, they train, this is their passion. This is their, this is their life's work. And to have that taken away from them as, as many other families did that I don't know this to be a fact, but I, I wouldn't doubt that there are many in the theatre industry who actually had to access food bank as well. So again, I think it, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. And I know that um, that it's always impactful for the cast and the production team, and the staff of the Grand and, and, and other theatres uh, that do the work as well. But uh, this year will be extra special, I think. And, and you know, people will feel it uh, probably more deeply in a more personal way than they ever have before. Yeah, I remember when the cast came down and uh, they were sorting food and, uh, you know, I was talking to one of the cast members about that, you know, we helped 25 other agencies. Well, he didn't know that. He thought yeah. that what they were doing well, for him was that he was helping the food bank because he really believed in the food bank. But I think it's really true that the cast of, of the Grand and the Grand as an organization has helped all of these other organizations year after year after year. That doesn't come to just the food bank. It gets spread around through the whole community. And the Grand is a community organization. In fact, you're, you're like a nonprofit, right? Like I think a lot of people don't understand that. How does that work? Well, we are a not-for-profit uh, 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 theater. The Grand is a not-for-profit theater. And so that was one of the things that we we really we thought about, you know, uh, when Dennis came to us with the idea first, we did think, well, wait a second here. At the end of the year, we actually go out and ask for donations to support the theater and the activities and the youth programming and all the community outreach that we do. How is this going to impact that? And in fact, it's, um, you know, um, it, really ha it really had no impact at, at all. And, and in fact, it it, it just helps us solidify what we are, who we are as a community partner. So um, it's it's been it's been quite remarkable in that regard. That you know the people of London, as you know, are incredibly generous, and people have passions, and people have multiple passions. Yeah. People who donate to the arts community also donate donate to our health, uh, to the health sector, and to child welfare, and to that type of thing. So you know the people of London give as much as they can possibly give. That that thing that. I know for sure. So um, it, it really, um, it's really, you know, as a not-for-profit theater, yes, we do rely on donations. Uh, ticket revenue does not, uh, covers about 70%, 60 to 70% of, you know, our overall revenue. And we do have to rely on donations and corporate sponsorships in order for us to meet a balanced budget. So, um, but again, as I say, like this, this year-end appeal, um, hasn't really um, hasn't really impacted us at all, at all to the negative. It's in, in fact, it's probably it's probably helped us out. I think it makes people appreciate you more. But yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting because that mindset, the not for profit mindset, I mean, I think that leads the organization to do some interesting things that you might not normally think of. For instance, you had an outreach to high schools. Right. And I, I know that was something that Dennis believed in a lot, too. But how did that work out? The, are you talking about the 100 Schools program? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So the 100, the, our 100 Schools program um, was... Uh, 
came as a result of us not being able to do enough with it was actually uh, the the public school level it was it was the primary level schools that um, we we actually do a lot in the community for high school aged kids um, and we have a student club we have a high school project um, you know a lot of our a lot of our offerings on both of our stages appeal to um, high school based um, uh, kids of high school age, but we don't do a lot for the younger kids. So when Dennis arrived, again, another one of his commitments was instead of, um, instead of bringing the schools that can afford to come and that, that are within a close geography of the grand, um, instead of bringing those, uh, limited, um, kids into the theater, we're going to go out to to uh, the schools in the area and so our first year of 100 schools program we had 100 schools in and we 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 provided a professionally a professional theater production in gyms in libraries sometimes in hallways um and it was for the entire school so whether the school was kindergarten to grade eight or kindergarten to grade five um, the entire school participated and the entire school took part in it and so so our first year was we hit 30,000 kids i some Something like you know 300,000 kilometers we traveled and we started out so we started far away from the schools that really could never come to the grand and and the teachers that could never come to the grand um, and the students so we started out and then we worked our way back in um, we worked with the school boards closely to identify the high need schools and the schools that really didn't get a whole lot of that extra and so it was it was incredible success successful program and we're really proud of that our second year of 100 schools unfortunately had to be cut short because of covid um, but you know, who knows what's what's in store for the future of that program? I know, I know that the teachers and the students really, really loved it. Suzanne, we're going to miss you. We've become friends through this uh, process, I know, and uh, it's been wonderful. But really, for people like Jane and I, for our volunteers, you know, um, I know about Dennis and how creative and how wonderful he is, and about the about the the cast as well, and those that work at the Grand. But really, it was you and Deb that became the face of the Grand to us. You were the ones that we were dealing with, and always it was positive. Always it was about what can we do to help. Always you were trying to help Jane and I to get down to see the uh, see some of the performances or you were trying to get the cast to come to the food bank I, I really think that the you know I've known the grand for a lot of years but in the last uh, number of years it's taken on this human face that's very diverse you know it, it's not just uh, one segment of London it's all these different areas of it are coming there it's a malay all around there of all these different people always doing these different things I hope that you you say and the depth sense senses that you've transformed the place, not just the building. I know it's been through all sorts of renovations, but and, and not just within the Grand, but how the community now sees the Grand is totally different. It, it's essential, I think, and, and it reflects people look at the Grand and see themselves in it. And I, no, no matter where they're from, and I, I just think that that's so wonderful, and you've accomplished that, and, and I hope you know that. And I know that you'll take that to Hamilton, but I hope you know that so much of that is due to you, Suzanne. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. I, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting as I, I uh, in my first couple of weeks at uh, Theatre Aquarius in Hamilton, I come to find out that, that they do a similar type of uh, of uh, um, support of their Lund of their Hamilton Food Share program, so uh, my heart just uh, I felt so I felt so happy that 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 was happening, and I think that Theater Aquarius, the Grand Theater, um, uh, Theater Calgary, I think are just three of probably the many many theaters, uh, professional theaters across Canada who are who are working to support their local uh, their local food program. So it's just it's been a delight. It's been a delight, and I know that you know I can't. Can't wait to go into the grand and see elf myself and and uh, be part of the audience so um yeah it's been a, it's been a delight to get to know you and jane and all of the folks on on the business cares committee well you know uh, tomorrow morning i'm going to make a phone call to hamilton because Sudan, uh, suzanne uh, sorry uh, joanne santucci who's the head of hamilton future has been at food banks almost as long as we have and we're great friends and stuff but uh, i just uh, i want to let her know just personally what we think of you and what you've done for us and just to express our appreciation thank you for what you've done for london i know you're still you're staying here right and you're going yeah. to for now is that correct yeah it's my it's my it's my i feel like very much it's my home city 
So I'm commuting to Hamilton um, for as long as my as long as my car and my my mental health will allow. But yeah, I, I very you know I, I feel very much a part of uh, a part of this community and and helping out on Grocery Weekend this year again. So I'm excited about that. You've done wonders for this uh, city, Suzanne. Thank you. And you've been the face of a lot of that stuff. And your enthusiasm, I think, really drew a whole bunch of us. And thank you for that. I uh, wish you all the best this Christmas. And I wish you all the best, too, in Hamilton. I'm sure that they're going to be very lucky to have you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you so much. Jeff from Chillin' and Grillin' with Jeff. We're back for season three. We've had the opportunity to see some great backyards and have some great barbecue. Join us, Chillin' and Grillin' with Jeff. Welcome again to London Lights. Today on our show, we're going to take a little bit of a darker turn. We typically have a very upbeat type of uh, vibe to our show with laughter and uh, good feelings. But today we're going to take a dark turn. We're going to be talking about the sinister criminal history of London. And my guest today is author of the book Murder City, Michael Arnfield. Michael, welcome to London Lights. Thanks for having me on, Dan. It's good to have you. Uh, I want to read your bio before we get started and let people know who you are. So Dr. Michael Arnfield is a PhD professor at Western University, where he founded the Cold Case Society, an unsolved crimes think tank that pairs students with forensic subject matter experts. He's also the author of the new book, How to Solve a Cold Case, along with over a dozen of other titles, including Murder City which details the sordid history of serial killers in London, Ontario. He currently appears as an expert on crime and policing in television series airing on several networks, has previously served as a visiting professor in the United States and Australia, and routinely provides training for police services and forensic associations around the globe. From 1999 to 2014, he was a police officer and a detective with the London Police Service. Again, Michael, welcome. Good to have you here. I knew your father much better than you uh, because he was a Crown Attorney in London, and he and I locked horns uh, many times over the years uh, as I did criminal de defense work. Uh, I want to say that as a young constable also, you would have cross-examined me in the late 90s. I, I do believe you were still in the game then. Yeah, I think I was. So, uh, yeah, it's all part of the process, and uh, criminal trials are quite fascinating. This whole area, to me, is extremely fascinating, and I found your book to be incredibly fascinating. Uh, here's a picture of it. I picked up my copy at the local library, and uh, I, I couldn't turn it, stop turning the pages. It was just a page turner, and I was enthralled from beginning to end not only to learn about this incredible dark side of the history of London, Ontario, but again, it is London, Ontario. It's my hometown. And uh, that aspect of it was, was very fascinating to me. So what got you involved in this line of work? Well, I would have come on the LPS around the time that Project Angel, which is discussed in the book, which was the first uh, dedicated cold case task force in Ontario was uh, sort of up and running. And this was spurred by advances in DNA and by the fact that the DNA data bank, the National DNA data bank was going online and that uh, a number of these historical cases province-wide could be solved now. So as my law enforcement career is beginning, I'm very much aware of the existence of this exciting task force in the background and ended up getting to know some the lead investigators uh, on that task force fairly well. Fast forward uh, 15 years or so, and uh, it turns out that the task force detectives had sought the counsel, had sought the advice of a retired OPP uh, detective inspector named Dennis Alsop. He died uh, 
sort of during the tail end of, of my police career, but by then I had already completed a PhD at Western and had started the Cold Case Society. So he was at least sort of collaterally aware of my work. And what he did was he left uh, original source materials, crime scene logs, photos, uh, his original notes, teletypes between he and other police agencies across Ontario, which were all uh, essentially his property to take with him at the time. There was no retention uh, policies then. So um, he left it in a box for his son to find, and his son knew of my work and, and turned it over to me. And very rarely in, in, in writing a true crime, uh, a work of true crime or, or a work of history generally, do you get direct access to what we call primary source materials like that. So I'm not writing a book based on reading other people's books and relying on their footnotes and endnotes and research. I have the original artifacts from which I can glean information that has never before um, been revealed. And I mean, contained in those boxes is, it was remarkable information. The, the, cold, the Project Angel investigators sort of scratched the surface, but they more or less just went to meet with him and, and sort of kick some ideas around uh, there's stuff in there that ultimately, uh, I mean, is unassailable in terms of its importance from both a local history perspective as well as a criminological perspective in terms of what happened in London over that 25 to 30 year period being without precedent. Well, you've done an incredible job in this book, tying all these facts together and revealing them for the first time to the general public. And I think even watching this show or reading the book or both, Londoners are going to be shocked to find out that sleepy old London, Ontario, tucked between the big smoke of uh, Toronto and Detroit, the forest city, so to speak, has this really dark side to it that most of us were completely unaware of. And these details are revealed in the book. And, and like I described, I was enthralled by it. I couldn't stop turning the pages. It was so fresh, but also so enlightening. And the tales gave me the creeps. This was a scary time. And uh, I remember being a child during that time. But would you agree with me? And and and, and is, is the thrust of the book that London was the serial killer capital of Canada at the time and perhaps North America? Based on the available data, that's exactly what, what we can conclude. I mean, when, when you look at the fact that there are six confirmed, nine hypothesized uh serial killers operating either concurrently or uh, consecutively or near consecutively, essentially contemporaneously, as we'd say, over the, this period, uh, with a population the size that London had, which it, you know, it grew a little bit during this period. But I mean, um, the best example I can, I can give is if you were to, on a per capita basis, overlay that same number to a population base of, of New York City, uh, I mean, you'd have uh, about 100 serial killers active in New York City at any given time. And at its maximum, uh, New York is believed to have had three. London had nine. So wow. you can, the, 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 the offender to civilian ratio, uh, again, based on reliable data, is not seen anywhere else on the continent uh, or among the G7 as, as best reliable records are available during that period. Well, that's incredible. I, I think London's will just be shocked to hear that. But I remember growing up as a kid in the 1960s, east of Adelaide, uh, I knew there was something ominous going on, even as an innocent young kid. Uh, my parents, uh, you know, the newspaper would come in some days and quickly they'd set it aside so that I wouldn't be able to see it. And they would be reporting on some of these stories as they hit the press. And the parents would always be warning, uh, you know, I want you to know, don't take candy from a stranger. Don't take a ride with anybody that might offer you a ride to school. I knew something was going on. And then there were some odd things that happened. A couple times, uh, I used to hang out at the Thames River with all my friends. And uh, and I remember there's a, a, a guy there that exposed himself to us and we all started laughing and ran away, but it wasn't a funny matter. And then another time, uh, one night, family's all sitting around the house watching uh, Hockey Night in Canada at around 8 p.m. one night, and there's this frantic knock at the door, and here's this disheveled uh, young lady who'd just been attacked on the front lawn of our rental property in East London. 
and uh, there are some scary things going on. What, uh, and, and I like how you highlight in the book about how a lot of this uh, starts with something like indecent exposure and then comes on or goes on to something more serious. Yeah, we much better understand now the, the pathways that um, sexually motivated offenders, and, and the vast majority of serial homicide is, of course, sexually motivated, but the, you, you don't necessarily begin there. You begin with, with these, these gateway behaviors, what are known as preparatory behaviors. And you're right, for years, even when I was uh, a street cop, you could count the first count on the first spring day of every year uh there'd be at least you know three four arrests for indecent act in, in one of the public parks and it was sort of uh even then by the late 90s treated as just sort of uh this is a london sort of local local character uh we now understand the literature supports an improved understanding that indecent acts uh are strongly associated with sadistic behavior because of course it's, it's the frightening of the person or, or the the alarm that that committing that act usually towards children uh, causes, uh, and that the person, the offender, is experimenting with the degrees of, of fear and embarrassment that they can cause, and that it, this will ultimately only escalate. This is why committing an indecent act very quickly once the DNA data bank went online was what we call a secondary DNA offense. Even though there was no direct physical contact the way there would be with some other sex crimes, uh, the nature of it and the, the, the clinical understanding of it, uh, even by by that point, um, made it an offense that, based on the facts and issue, based on the totality of the circumstances, the judge could order that person's sample into the DNA, DNA data bank as a, as a convicted offender, uh, knowing full well that we'll probably turn up at another crime scene uh, some point down the road, and that match needs to be made when when, and if that time ever arrives. And I want to come back to the DNA issue in a minute, but if anything about this whole story, there are all these negatives, but there were some pod positives that came out of it as well. And I'm thinking about the fact that one of the way Londoners responded to this concern about kids and kids being uh, captured and killed was the Block Parent Program. And this was a London uh, invention, correct? And it spread as a safety mechanism across the country. Yeah. So, I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. And and the thought was, and, and London, I, I, I guess, culturally was just sort of a place where, where this, this could be an experimental program whereby you have, unfortunately, children being pursued by men in cars, uh, children being snatched off the street the street in the middle of the day in suburban uh traditionally low crime areas uh but in those same areas owing to the fact that london is a, a traditional con socially conservative city you often have people home ho homemakers home during the middle of the day so the thought was by displaying this placard in your window making it readily visible from the street a child in distress being pursued could run to that house to seek sanctuary knowing that there was a housekeeper there, there was a stay-at-home mom there, and that person would ensure their safety and call the police. So essentially you had these, these safety outposts sprinkled throughout suburbia, um, which when we discuss it now sounds actually insane that th this was required in, in a, a essentially Main Street Canadian little city. Um, but the idea caught on, and the idea was that your neighbors are the best eyes and ears when it comes to preventing and interdicting crime uh, and in closing ranks to make sure that predators can't operate undetected in these neighborhoods, which they were for many years before that, because, of course, and the case sort of remains the same, is Londoners don't want to talk about what's going on in their backyard, not in unvarnished fashion. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just not a reality that people are prepared to confront, unfortunately. Well, kudos to those people in London that not only came up with this idea, but put it into place and all of the uh, various homes around the city that provided this place of sanctuary. Because again, I remember walking home from school and you'd see that placard in the front window and you knew, okay, if something happens, this is where I can go for safety. So it's quite an innovation and, uh, and kudos again to the city of London for that. So listen, we're gonna take a quick break. Hang on, hang on viewers. We'll be right back with Professor Michael Arnfield talking about his book, Murder City.
This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Okay, everybody stay very still. Watch all new episodes of Hudson and Rex Sundays. So what do you do exactly? I'm a detective. I'm a forensicist. I'm sort of like a cyber detective. Cyber detective. The bark plus the bite is one great night. <laughs> Hudson and Rex, all new Sundays, 8, 7 central on City TV or stream on City TV Plus, the app or CityTV.com. Did you have fun? Check this out. It's nice, right? Action on Rogers TV. Welcome back to London Lights, where we're talking about the incredible book, Murder City. Talking about London during a period of time in the 1960s, 1970s, when essentially we were the serial killer capital of Canada. It's quite a fascinating tale, but it's a true tale. It's not a fairy tale. And Mike, as I read the book, of course, having grown up in London, being so familiar with all the different scenes in the streets that you describe in the book, one of the stories that haunted me was the story about the ongoings or the goings-on at Stanley Variety. There's a picture in the book. That's haunting to me because my father was a, he delivered milk for Mark Gare's Dairy, and we used to get in the truck at five in the morning and load it up with milk and drive out to Byron from East London. And every day we'd drive by that Stanley variety. And from the outside, it looked like this um, quite fascinating, fun place to get candy and other treats. And uh, you reveal in the book that there was some dark goings on in that place. And it, it was creepy stuff. Yeah, little is known about the proprietor of, of, of that um, store during that period, other than he had associates who were known to be members of um, what today would be the trafficking, largely, of, of child pornography. Uh, and I mean, even if you drive past that place today or in recent years, I mean, visitors to the city will drive past it and, and like there's just something ominous and, and, and decaying about that. It, it largely looks as is from that period. The signage is still there and you can just sense that something bad happened there. So um, these were leads pursued by um, the investigator, the OPP investigator, who of course, many of these bodies ended up in OPP jurisdiction. Uh, but he took great interest in, in, as did the London detectives, he worked with in what was going on in the basement of that of that store, which was really sort of a dead drop uh, for stag films, for uh, what would be what would constitute child pornography. We know that uh, the men dropping off these materials or acquiring materials there hung around there um, is what we call in, in, in criminology a, a crime attractor, meaning that is the type of location where known offenders, motivated offenders will know that there are uh, vulnerable victims. There's a stock pool of victims. There's employees, young employees working alone. There's children going there for candy, like like you mentioned. Uh, and ultimately, uh, one of the, uh, speaking of Byron, one of the uh, counter attendants there working there part-time, Jacqueline Dunleavy, uh, is last seen locking up there and then found some distance away where she'd been driven uh, and, and murdered in a very ritualistic fashion. This is one of the more disturbing cases in the book, but all roads lead back in that case, and I believe in some other cases, to that story. Yeah, very sad uh, tale, and uh, uh, it just, again, makes gives you the creeps when you, uh, when you read about it. But there is a hero in this story, from my perspective, and that's the detective that you named. Uh, as I read about him, 
I thought, wow, like this is a guy who was really doing the best he could with the limited resources of crime fighting tools that were available at the time. And he's playing a game of whack-a-mole, so to speak. You know, he's, he hears of one, uh, one murder, and then uh, as he's starting to work that one, another one pops up. And he's going from place to place trying to solve these crimes. And it wasn't easy, given the lack of resources at the time. DNA wasn't available, correct? No, not for many other decades. And we didn't have video surveillance like we do now, which is such a key uh, player in solving so many of these crimes. What can you tell me about Detective Elsa? So he was the uh, intelligence officer in World War II, um, where he would essentially like a code breaker uh, insofar as, as Canadians were involved in, in, in that type of uh, counterintelligence. Uh, then he came back, joined the OPP, and was originally a forensics officer. So he, he gathered a lot of, based on the knowledge of the day, um, training about fingerprinting, patent versus latent impression evidence, uh, all the pre-sort of modern DNA, uh, you know, super scientific stuff that we're accustomed to, but that at the during the day was stock and trade if you were going to be an effective investigator. And then he sort of diverged from strictly forensics to then working uh, as a um, regional detective, so the West Region based out of the London office, or Middlesex Centre office. And what happened was most of the London victims, owing to London's odd geography then and now, in that you sort of have this, um, this outpost city surrounded by rural hinterland uh victims would be acquired in london the primary crime scene would be in london but the secondary crime scene of the dump site would be in opp jurisdiction so you had dual investigations going on uh, a fair bit and you equate this with a lot of u.s cases where we see uh infamous serial killers killing in one state dumbing the body in another state so the fbi needs to get involved or a task force needs to be created he basically was the task force, a one-man task force piecing together these, these bodies found in rivers and farmers' fields and other places in his jurisdiction, and then trying to track the final movements of these victims back to London, which is ultimately where um, they were acquired. Uh, and then factor in the third variable, which is that so many of these offenders, and this is in part my explanation often in the book for why London very quickly um, became the serial killer capital is many of the offenders are also not from London. So you have uh, the King's Highway system bringing in offenders from other regions, killing in London, and on their way out of town, they'll, they'll, they'll pose or dispose of, of a body in an OPP jurisdiction. So you really have this divide and conquer uh, methodology, MO, being used by the offenders that uh, threw a wrench into the investigations, but between um, some circumstantial evidence uh, gathered by ALSUP and some remarkable preservation of crime scene samples and clothing during this period uh, in London. Uh, we've got now strong persons of interest in many of these cases, and we've got DNA samples that are still, that have not degraded that, you know, 40, 50 years later, 60 years later in one case, uh, can still be tested today, which means these cases are resolvable. I can just imagine the personal struggles that he must have gone through as the one-man task force, essentially, knowing that something very bad is happening all around the city and, uh, and having his hands tied behind his back in terms of trying to solve these crimes. This is before the internet, of course, and communication between OPP and London, as you point out in the book, uh, would be a challenge. Uh, is he was he recognized at the time as a hero, or is he really not getting his due until somebody reads your book and finds out more about what he was doing? Yeah, I mean, by the um, by the mid seventies, he's largely chained to a desk in Toronto, uh, and had been sort of promoted out of being able to to be boots on the ground and, and, and investigate these cases and. Uh, whether that was done strategically because he was ruffling feathers or whether that was um, just part of his natural career progression. I mean, he, he's continued to work the cases remotely. So the early, uh, you know, remote working, he's in Toronto at a desk, but he's still uh, delving into files and, 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 and having errands run in and around London to try to track down people or, or, or exhibits or, or what have you. I mean, at one point he consulted with a, a, a theology professor at uh, 
Huron University College, which is an affiliated college at Western, um, who was a known expert in demonology, asking for his insight as to whether this was occult activity and whether or not because of the ritual nature of some of these murders, this was a case of child sacrifice going on in London. So, I mean, he was, he didn't rule anything out for sure. And uh, of course, he's an OVP detective, but he is living in and raising his children in the city of London. So this is very much a visceral reality for him as well when he goes home. And, and it's interesting you mentioned that about uh, consulting with theology, because there's a real evil aspect to the things that are happening, as you describe in the book. And uh, there's so many victims uh, that, that we, we learn about in the book. Scott Leishman, 16 years old. Uh, Linda White, uh, she's 19. You talk about Jackie English. Uh, Robert Stapleton, age 11 in uh, 1969. Patricia Brown, scary, scary stuff. But we have a fascination. Many people do, maybe for the wrong reasons. Uh, some for the right reasons. I mean... Uh, sometimes my wife will see me watching uh, the first 48, which is a reality murder show on A and E, and she'll comment, "You know, why are you interested in that stuff?" But I see a lot of times it's the good guys who win when they solve these crimes and they effectively bring about justice. So there's some fascinating tales there, and really, that's the way I look at it: good over evil. Um, it, it almost sounds like the work of a a movie here. Uh, the detective you mentioned, a real hero doing his best that he can. Uh, has there been any talk about interest, about a movie about these stories? Yeah, I mean, uh, from actually before the book was, was published to the present, various production companies or studios have held the rights to, to turn it into either an uh, unscripted, so that would be like a documentary format, or scripted, so... Um, something like Dahmer, based on actual events, but but with creative license, uh, series for streaming or cable or for a motion picture. The, the, the issue, and this isn't uncommon with a lot of, of books where there's widespread interest, I mean, um, is they remain in development in perpetuity because no one really has the secret sauce to figure out how to bring this to life. I mean, if this were to be done as a scripted period piece, it's a Canadian story, um, you know, you need almost an international co-production to get money from other countries to get the types of resources needed to procure. I mean, this isn't Warner Brothers that we've got on hand anywhere near here. So we don't have a fleet of 60s vehicles to be used in the background. We don't have uh, 60s wardrobes like you have in, in, in a lot of these big budget U.S. productions. So I think it would require... Uh, and this has been looked at, turning this into like a, a U.S., Canadian, U.K. type of we'll call co-production to make sure that because the story is universally interesting, it just happens to have happened in Canada. It's not a Canadian story per se. And if and I think uh, moving this from development to production will require, I, I think, people, producers and studios in other countries recognizing that. Well, I think there is a really rich material there to work with. And again, the book that we're talking about is Michael's book, Murder City, uh, when London was the serial killer capital of Canada. Uh, scary times, but uh, at the end of the day, the good news is that police are getting a lot better at solving these types of crimes with DNA and other resources that have, that have come along. So, Michael, thanks be, for being with us today to talk about this. It's important work, and you're doing a great job at it, and I do recommend to all the viewers that they go out and get your book and read this fascinating story about a dark time in our city's history. Thanks for being here, Mike. Take care of yourself and let's keep in touch. You bet, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us 
or connect with us on social media. Wednesdays on City TV. I guess it's just another day in the ED, huh? Get ready for what comes next. Ready? Let's do this. That's what we train for. Go with them, get everything you can get. Hit him fast. Chicago Med, Fire, and PD. All new episodes Wednesdays on City TV. What a night. Or stream on City TV Plus, the app, or CityTV.com. It isn't the heavy trays that make the job difficult or the fast pace you need to keep up. It's not working another double because someone called in sick. What makes the job